Okay. Hi, David. I um I've just sent around some stuff for Hi Sarah about Hi. the steering group meeting and the content of the website. Um, there's a there's a line there about data, and I'm hopefully looking in your direction because you seem to have much more of the handle on on data and what might be there and how it might be collected than than anybody else. So. Uh, I'll just sort of tee you up for that and see if uh, what thoughts you might okay. have. Okay, this is data about people or about possible things you can do? Well, it's an open question, David, because uh, we've talked about, and you were one of the first to mention, that there has to be some element of data within the, the website we're developing. Um, and there are things about, you know, what data is it? Is it, is it links to national statistics is it stuff posted by councils you know and so on and so forth so mm -hmm. um i think any recommendations you might have would be uh, uh, to start the conversation would be brilliant okay yeah i'm just checking out with disley parish council how much it cost them to uh, put in their vehicle charging points and where they got the money from sarah are you looking at it as if you've got a very low tide behind you uh, yes, but it's uh, it's not where I am. <laughs> oh, it, you, uh, yeah, you see, lying. it's a secret place. It is a little place called Solver in the west of Wales, in Pembrokeshire. Okay. And that's where I was um, born and brought up. And at the age of 19, I skipped over the border into England and have never lived there back in Solver since. I go down, but it's a bit of a long way from living in Kent. Mm, indeed it is. Yes, mm. yes. I must change that picture, actually, and get one of um, high tide, of, of mm. tide in the harbour. Because <laughs> it's um natural harbour. goes. In fact, it goes further up outwards to sea um, on the, on sort of that way. And then it, up the harbour to the village the other way. So where are you with reference to Pembroke Dock there? You bit um, up on the north. So you've yeah. got um, Pembroke Dock. Then you've got Milford on the other side of the estuary of a river clad eye. Yeah. And then if you keep going um, sort of from Milford, if you keep going north, we're the next village to St David's, the smallest city in the UK. Okay. On the way, the main road to St. David's. Well, let me just say good morning whilst I can to Tristram, Sarah and Stuart. Good day to good you morning. both, all three of you. And Brian also gets... Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Yeah. So, Sarah, where does your sweater hail from? Newfoundland. Does it? It does. Oh, it's uh, 20 miles. Uh, yeah, still keeping me warm. Gorgeous. Thank you. I'm very proud of it. In the um, in the days of propeller driven across transatlantic aircraft, we used to stop at Gander quite frequently to refuel and survive. And... <laughs> In the days when I used to travel courtesy of the Royal Air Force, they dropped to us off once there saying that you can't go any further, but we can. Goodbye. <laughs> and I was introduced to Newfoundland checkers. Do you know about Newfoundland checkers? No, I don't. Sounds interesting. Checkers being the American word for drafts. Mm -hmm. So they play drafts with glasses of black and white rum. And every time you huff somebody, or you, take the <laughs> yes. gift, you have to drink it. It's an extremely, <laughs> extremely dangerous game. <laughs> I've never been the same since. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Well, it's certainly quite a place. I'd love to go back. Maybe one day. Very chilly in the winter, at least. It's actually on the same zip latitude as um, um, mm -hmm. Brittany, isn't it? It's south of us. But because we've got the Gulf Stream, we're warmer. Uh, they called Cottage Road on the Scariots. This is the Gulf Stream, which they say uh, could well stop in uh, the next uh, few years, 20 yes. to 100 years. Yeah, indeed. Anyone around with a Greenland ice cap? Hi, Cara, good to see you. Yes, that's right. Hello, good to see you all too. 
Hello. Got Steve oh, and Jackie and Peter. Oh, Peter is not fine yet. Actually, I've muted Tristram. He's making too much noise. <laughs> So we'll wait a few more minutes uh, on the grounds that there are always some people who are, are caught up on phone calls or late or racing home to feed the dog and then get online. This is quite a useful practice session for me, actually, because um, Net Zero, I think this is Andrew's kind office again, have um, asked me to contribute to something um, when I'm away on holiday. So they've asked if I could record something, which would be a first for me, so I should be wearing my jumper. <laughs> and yeah, if this one works out okay, then um, I think job done for the next one. So it was all worth use it twice. These Val Dunican moments, yes, indeed. <laughs> oh my gosh, that going to admit, isn't it? I'm I'm told there's a group that call themselves the Val Dunicans, and yes, they all turn out in these nice jumpers. But um, mm. there we are. Did you ever wear the same one twice? I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I I. I I would like to think that the, it, the BBC provided him with a new one each programme, but I can't say. Uh, does anybody know whether Val Dunican was gifted his jumpers or whether his, he and his family chose them? I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, sure, Mrs Dunican knitted them. No, I'm afraid he's no longer with us to ask. <laughs> but, uh, Sarah, I guess it, this was your way of inviting us all to be your guinea pigs. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In theory, should we should get about another eight people. So let me just give a couple more minutes to those who are still zooming in, hopefully. I have put a bunch of links in the chat for those who may be um, interested in follow-up um, discussions. And you'll be delighted to know that the Vicar of Disney shows up twice um, because we're all very, we think they're very important. Um, Disney, yes. yes. Irresistible, isn't it, when you think of it? Yeah. Graham, and I were, Graham and I were racing to put it up and he beat me to it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Wait till you get my introduction to Sarah. Oh, indeed. <laughs> so before we get going on today's topics, let me just check if anybody wishes to ask any questions. Please do feel very free to use the chat. Uh, today because it's uh, very useful to have a look at it later. I send it round to everyone with a copy of today's video and today's presentation, which Sarah assures me what you're going to see during the presentation is not what you're going to get at the end of it. Because she's um, part, oh, of the, <laughs> part of the actual... I promise that. Intriguing. Intriguing. <laughs> well, that was, that was before you sent the presentation. You said, I'm just going to wing it. And so I'll send out the details later. <laughs> that but is you, true. You, you did have a starting document, which I thought was admirably long, um, just to give your game away. But anyway, let's um, let's assume since it's five past 12 that those who are going to come are, are here. So welcome all. Thank you so much for showing up. And uh, I'm delighted that Sarah has very kindly decided to enlighten us this morning or this afternoon on the topic of EV charging points. Uh, Sarah is almost straight out of um, Hogwarts as far as her address is concerned. She's in Grindelwald, which sounds like a very um, sort of Harry Potter type address. Um, but before we just get going, Sarah, the, I suddenly see that Amanda's raised her hand. Good morning or afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, everybody. And Sarah, um, please do excuse me in um, interrupting your introduction. Um, it was just I, I did email to say that I'm not sure that I can stay for the whole session. So in case I can't stay, um, I just wanted to highlight that SLCC are offering a training course um, because it's coming up in the next few weeks um, and it's for clerks. I Ideally, I think it's for clerks, but it's just as members and non-members, the same price. And it's around um, climate change and, or, or rather carbon uh, literacy and our parish council's duties. So um, I, I wanted to particularly highlight that just in case I can't answer mm. the presentation. 
So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Amanda. You. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me press on with introducing uh, Sarah to you, who is going to chat um, with all the topics we, we knew nothing about, but we want to go for. And uh, I will be um, sharing my screen to present Amanda's um, slides. So if you get a, a, a command saying next one, you'll know that I've um, lost attention for a moment. <laughs> so let me start by uh, putting a slide up and then Sarah, it'll be all yours. Lovely, thank you. Great stuff, thank you very much. Here you go. Yep, super. So um, I have actually completely uh, winged this and I don't know if I've got two hours worth of material or, or 10 minutes, so we'll see how we go along. And um, I just thought I'd tell you before I start that I'm not posing as an expert of any sort. Um, I'm a parish clerk of a little little village, which is actually Grind Grindle Ford. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Graham. Oh, shucks. <laughs> It's close. Still sounds um, very Potterish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's something to do with the ford across the river that was made out of the grindstones that sharpen the knives in Sheffield. So it has a certain kind of magic to it. Just a mm. different thought. Um, so I did the Carbon Literacy Trust training uh, last year, which I'd recommend to anybody who's uh, got a little bit of time. It's very good, comprehensive run through the connections between how we got into this mess in the first place um, and some ways of how to get out of it. And at the end of that training, you have to make a pledge. So my pledge in a kind of rush of enthusiasm was to get a, a public EV charging point into the village. And I feel a certain sense of responsibility to at least try to make that happen, which is why I've got into all of this and got quite interested. Um, so it all began. Um, so my husband, who's in his mid fifties, had a midlife crisis and decided to buy a sports car. And I think he noticed the sense of derision in my voice when he spotted this little red thing. And I said, so yeah, yeah, of course you can have that. And um, embarrassed, he moved on to the next car in the showroom, which was an EV car. And to cut a long story short, we bought that one. And uh, we're now absolute uh, evangelists for EV cars because it's super. Um, and it's um, just seemed to me that maybe um, it would be a good idea if everybody could have one if they wanted one. I mean, you can, for example, if you've got a renewable energy supply, put the air conditioning on without feeling guilty about the carbon. And I mean, for me, that's a winner. So setting out to try and make sure if anybody in the village wanted to have uh, an EV car, they could do. And um, the difficulty is that the, the government funding from OZEF, well, government funding generally, is pretty much focused on to um, the local authority level now rather than down to parish council level, which it was uh, last year. So if you're going to have to do something like this, you're going to have to do it by yourself. Uh, and find your own money and so forth. That obviously makes life a lot more difficult, but that's what we're trying to do. So um, can you go back a slide, please, Graham, to the uh, uh, all about Grindleford one? So that's Grindleford there. Um, as you can see, it's pretty spread out. It's very hilly. Uh, and the notion of having some sort of central point where you can have charging points is going to mean that about 80% of the population will be walking up a steep hill in the rain. So it's not a very easy place. I'm sure other places are easier. I'm sure lots of other places are just as difficult. Um, so that's the sort of terrain that we're starting with. And then, yes, please, next slide, if that's okay, thank you. Um, in another piece of work, um, I started doing some sums and came up with some very alarming statistics, which I've sort of spelt out here um, because they are quite impactful. Um, we all know that 25% of emissions come from transport. In this little village alone of 1,000 1, people, we collectively drive 10 times around the world every year, which, I mean, when I came out with that number and it's sort of double checked because my maths isn't very good. That's just a thousand of us. So you can imagine how far we're going nationally. It's quite scary, really. Um, and in the process of doing that, we're producing 450 tonnes of CO2 if we're all doing those miles in petrol cars. Um, I don't know if anybody's done the World, world say it again, World Wildlife Fund cal Carbon Calculator. Um, it's, it's a cracking little thing. It's ever so quick. And it divides um, your carbon emission into various things like heating and transport and the stuff you buy and so forth. And it's all measured in WWF type animals. So instead of saying two tonnes of carbon, it says four polar bears. Um, and for me, that was really quite helpful because I don't know how heavy, I know that it sounds ridiculous, I don't know how heavy a tonne of carbon is. 
I can't sort of imagine a ton of carbon, but I can imagine two polar bears. Um, so 450 tonnes of um, uh, CO2 is 900 polar bears each year in Grindleford alone, which is um, kind of a way to get hold of it, what we're actually sticking up there into the atmosphere. 30% of our housing stock doesn't have off-road parking. Um, and doing a little bit of inquiry, I don't think that's terribly uh, unusual statistic. I think by and large, that's about right. E even in towns, 30% is um, of off who don't have off-road parking. And of course that means snaking a cable across the pavement. And while it's not absolutely impossible, it's definitely very suboptimal and not very many people want to do it. Not least because if someone chips up on it, it's your liability. So, you know, it's a not an ideal solution. And um, just multiplying up that uh, that number of 450 tonnes, that take the 30% and then times it by some very, very um, suspect mass indeed. But we are talking about several million tonnes of CO2 national, which can't be nationally, which can't be abated because people can't charge their electric cars. So we're sort of stuck. So I hope that sets the scene for why we're quite keen, A, to do this in our village and B, to try and find a solution which might work more widely. By the way, I should have said, uh, if anybody wants to chip in and ask a question, I'm going along, please do. Um, as I say, this is all, I kind of making it up as I go along, but in a very informed way. So um, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts because I might not know the answers. So um, I think the first thing that came to our mind when we started looking at this was to do what everybody else has done and just stick a couple of charges in the middle of the village and hope that um, people would use them. Um, and there is an operation, well, there's lots and lots of organisations who are doing this. Um, Charge My Street is a really popular one because they'll put all the um, infrastructure in place and they will maintain it for free. So you don't have to find the uh, upfront capital. But what then happens is that they charge a, a per kilowatt charge which is, I think, Charge My Street's about 70 pence. There's another one called Believe Without an E, which is 55 pence. Either way, at 3.5 miles um, per kilowatt hour on average for an electric car, that's much more expensive than petrol. And as I will sort of ramble on a, a bit about in a moment, um, anybody who's doing this is doing it because they want to and not because they have to. So if they don't want to, they won't do it. And paying sort of two or three times more for petrol, uh, for electricity than there would be for petrol is a pretty big disincentive. So that's been a major problem for us to solve. Um, it's easier if you are, well, I'll come on to that in a minute about businesses and things. Um, so uh, could I have the next slide, please? You mean the one that was next mm. to that one or that one? that one? No, I think I like the one you had first time actually, sorry. I'm doing this off my phone. I haven't got my glasses on, so right. kind of making it up. Um, so um, yes, a little bit about how you um, you can't make people do things. A bit more on that, which is that um, there's a, a kind of phrase that I've heard banded about, which is "go where the people are," and I think you could translate that into work out what people's behaviours are um, and what it is that presses their buttons. So to use another example. If you're trying to get um, climate action going in your village generally, you'll find that people are really keen to plant trees um, and they're very keen to wildlife verges. They're much less keen to retrofit their houses or put solar panels on their roof. So you need to start where they are with the trees and the wildlife verges. Um, and I, I think we, we um, have decided that we need to start where people are with their cars. So it's kind of, you want to say, this is really straightforward. What you need to do is get a couple of charges. You only have to walk five minutes down the road and then walk five minutes back. But if they're, if it's raining, if they've got their children with them, if it's uphill, if they've got their shopping, if they're tired, if it's late at night, they just will not not going to do that. So um, doing a little bit of work on what people will do and what they won't do um, and what does press their buttons and what doesn't has been an exercise that we came to much too late in the day. We should have done it first. But we started off by saying, do this. Um, and nobody's interested. And now we've started saying, what would you like us to do? We started to get a lot more response. So um, that's been an interesting kind of growth point for us. Um, I keep saying we, it's a little group which has been set up um, kind of by accident with a couple of local residents, me as a parish clerk with a obligation to Carbon Literacy Trust, um, chap in the next, next village along who's interested in um, EV charging points installations. Um, Julian Ashworth, we have a 
climate big quite a big sort of nationally recognized climate action group up here called hope valley climate action who do lots of lobbying and um, other good works and they pay somebody to look at the ev charging end of things and um He's called Julian Ashworth. He's also on this group with lots of national collections. And finally, the, the jewel in the crown is a bloke called Joel Teague, who runs CoCharger. Has anybody heard of CoCharger? I hope you have. It's a really useful thing to know about. And, sorry, it's, it's um, am I right to plow on? Mm. I agree. So, um, the next point being team team visitors versus team residents. Um, we've we've discovered that there is quite a big difference between the two, certainly for us. Uh, there's a pub just in the next village along, which is set up to charge my street uh, charging points in their car park. And we were rather distressed to discover that nobody uses them. And um, we went and had a discussion with the, the people there and came up with the conclusions that if it comes to visitors, um, we, because we're in the Peak District, which is in between Sheffield and Manchester, anybody who's coming for the day can get there and back on one charge if they've got any sort of sensible um, EV car. Anybody who's going north to south, south to north, will go around on the motorway network and miss us completely. Um, and anybody who's coming to stay for a few days will have made previous arrangements, like there'll be um, recharging facilities in their Airbnb or their hotel or whatever. Um, so while we thought, if I think these guys thought if they put EV charges um, in their car park, everybody would come along and use them. They just haven't. And that's that's a really significant point um, about working out exactly what again what people are going to do and whether or not that includes you on their on their plans. Um, I'll just mention here at this point. I'm sure you all know about ZapMap, but if you don't, it's a really useful way of working out where EV charging points are and which ones are you which ones are working. Um, and whether or not it's going to be compatible with your car. Um, so that really basically left us with team residents because um, we don't think visitors are really our bag, if you see what I mean. Anybody, nobody wants to come to Grindelwald anyway, why would they? And um, so we've started to have a proper look as to how we might be able to um, put something in place which isn't two charging points in a car park and which does work for the people involved. And I tell you what, it is really, really hard. Um, but we were, we're not daunted. We thought we'd carry on. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about CoCharger. Uh, so Joel set this up because he woke up one morning and thought, how can we ensure that folks' next car isn't going to be a petrol car? Um, and then set up CoCharger as a result of that. So it's an app which allows you to borrow somebody else's charger, basically. And you book it and you pay for it through the app. And then someone else who might be your neighbour or they might be in Aberdeen, wherever it is you're about to go and visit, um, can use it. And you don't have to sort of speak to them, basically. You can do that. It's, do you know the um, park at my house? It's very much like that, but charging rather than just parking. Um, and the two parties, this is a really important point, the two parties can set their own tariff, which is really key to our, our plan. I say plan, that's a little bit of a grand term for a sort of big wish, but let's see how we get on. So, um, laboratory experiment. Uh, this is a picture of a row of terraced houses in the middle of Grindleford. And um, what happens is that everybody parks all the way along. You, you know exactly what I mean, nose to nose. Basically, there's um, about a car's worth for each house front. But because these houses are largely lived in by young families with children and dogs and things, uh, they've all got two cars. So there's really quite a lot of competition for parking spaces outside the houses. And anybody who gets back too late, it's very much a first come, first serve sort of thing. You won't necessarily get anywhere near your house, but you might get on the row. And if you don't, uh, then you have to go miles off and park somewhere else further down in the village. And it's quite a busy main road, so it's not all that great walking down back from your car if you've got a couple of kids in tow. So lots and lots of competition, very gentle, polite competition, but nevertheless competition for the parking spaces. And we reckon there's probably about 50% more cars than there are spaces. So this creates quite a big problem once you start introducing EV charging points on a kind of house by house basis, um, because um, the, the big issue with it is that if you just put one EV charging point in because you've only got one EV car, 
that then becomes that person's sort of parking space and they get a parking space outside their house even when everybody else has to sort of fight for it or some petrol car comes and parks on it and then of course they can't recharge their car so both of those options are really difficult and um, need to be solved in some way so cutting the long story short um the the current dream and i won't put it any more solidly than that is to put a row of eight bollards along the 16 houses um and that um will allow obviously everybody's parking outside to have at least the option of having a bollard to recharge at um to say the difficulty still remains if somebody with an ev car comes back late, late at night and there's no ev um charging point um then they, they're completely stuck and they won't be able to get to work in the morning. So there is another option in this little setup, which I'm calling a sort of laboratory uh, experiment because mm -hmm. these people are all really nice green-minded people and they, um, they're they signed up to see if it's, to have a go at this basically, even if it, try and make it work, even if it's difficult. Um, so we're quite lucky to have that group of people. And I think that's one reason why we want to go ahead and try and make a go of it to see whether or not having, un having discovered and unwrapped all the problems we can then make it work for people who maybe don't have that same sense of community. Um, so there's a, a chap who lives opposite in a house which does have off-road parking, who's prepared to offer a, a space which will always be empty. Um, we'll put a charger in somehow. And then there's a kind of overflow. So if anybody's really stuck. It sort of sounds OK once you've got low numbers of EV cars, but once everybody's got an EV car, it, it will be problematic again. But hopefully that won't happen so quickly that we won't be able to learn some lessons from it um, before we go along. So basically the plan is that we, the council, or we, one of the CICs that we have in the village, um, will put in this row of eight uh, eight bollards and somehow or another, sort of zzz, zzz, the residents will sort themselves out so that people who've got EV cars won't be uh, put in a position where they can't recharge, but people who've still got petrol cars um, we'll just shove along a bit if they have to, but hopefully won't be too disadvantaged. So I hope that's clear. It's 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 pretty wacky thinking, but on the other hand, if it works, then never mind. Einstein never worried about thinking wacky thoughts, so why should I? Um, so um, just some pictures of what the bollards might look like. And there's um, the first one was just, you know, giving a notion of the, the row going down the street. This one is... Um, it's pretty discreet, isn't it? So it's right on the curb next to a lamppost. I think one of you might be thinking, why don't you use the lamppost? And the answer is that they're too old in Grindleford. Otherwise, we'd be there already, I think. Um, and then you, just another photograph, which is the uh, the back-to-back -back bumpers. So you have to imagine that middle one is just one bollard. I couldn't find that photograph. But you can see two cars plugging into, into one bollard. So... I kind of feel in my mind that all the elements of making this work are probably there, um, but there are all sorts of problems which um, are probably going to stop us. But, you know, never mind. Who can say? Come on to those in a minute. Um, so we're going to have a group meeting of these residents fairly soon um, to just get them signed up to the, the detail as well as the principal. Uh, they're signed up to the principal already, which is good. Um, then um, we're going to go on to, I'm um, sorry, I'm going to go on to talking about um, what sort of charger now. How long have I been talking for, Graham? Twenty minutes. Right. Yes. But it says here, can talk about this at the end if there's time. Um, I was thinking if I'd only been talking for three minutes, I might um, fill up a bit of space, but... Um, it's just that there's fast chargers and slow chargers and rapid chargers, which you might already know about. But if you want some more information, do let me know, and I will be more than happy to talk to you about what I know. Um, as far as this little little uh, ingenious notion is concerned, we understand that out of an ordinary electricity supply in a house, you can run two seven kilowatt hours. That's the slow chargers. You can have two uh, charging points. So basically, we need to sign up four houses who would actually own, if you like, in inverted commas, um, the charging points and pay the electricity on it. But then using CoCharger, which is, da -da, is where CoCharger comes into it, um, the app would allow the reimbursement of the electricity bill and the booking, if we go into any sort of booking system, to happen without everybody having to sort of meet over the fence and hand over fivers, which I think actually is illegal anyway. 
Um, and so we're talking now about um, so so eight seven kilowatt uh, charging points going down the street, servicing sixteen cars. And um, the the reason we're thinking that seven kilowatt would be a good idea, even though they're slow, is that people will be parking outside their houses and wanting to charge overnight because they'll be using their cars during the day. And um, if you are charging overnight, we um, we the Batterbees have our electricity through Octopus. We have a renewable, obviously renewable energy company, and they do this absolutely stupendous um, nine p a kilowatt overnight charge, which is enough to charge our little tank. Um, which works at about 3p a mile. And that feels kind of very attractive indeed. You can imagine thinking, ooh, 3p a mile, might think about having an EV car. Whereas 40p a mile, definitely not thinking about having an EV car. So there are some really good deals out there. And um, this would allow those for residents to pick up on those deals. And because CoCharger allows you to charge your own tariff, we're not locked into these expensive tariffs. So. Um, the uh did I, did I excuse me just one second while i find out where i've got to how do we pay for these charges you're ahead of me there graham uh we don't know we haven't got faintest idea really but they're not that expensive they're not out of bounds and there's a bit of money kicking about the parish council's got a couple of thousand pounds there's a community fund um from carnivals and so forth which has got a bit of money in there and um we're quite good at you know going out and begging money off people so i think if we are talking about 8,000 quid, it's not impossible. Uh, if it was like 30,000 quid, it would be. So I think it's this is a kind of important um, point because if I'm miles out and they are more expensive, it's going to be a real showstopper. But hopefully we'll just we'll plough on, plough on while we don't know, which is kind of like my strap line for life, really. And um, if we can manage to get past all of that, um, then it's all plain sailing apart from these other three completely impenetrable problems which I'm about to tell you about. So um, the first one that as, as any um, parish councillor or clerk who's listening will know, um, we in Grindleford don't have power of competence, which means I haven't got the qualification and I'm no intention of getting it because uh, life's too short basically. And um, sorry, Andrew. And um, so if that's the case, we can't even begin to start thinking about running this operation. So we'd have to find a a CIC to do it for us. Fortunately, we've got two in the village who might be able to, or I think would be prepared to step up and sort of be like a front man for the whole thing and handle the money. Um, if you haven't got that, then I think it starts to be a problem. Um, the real absolute kind of cracker is the fact that the curbs belong to Derbyshire County Council. I don't know what your county councils are like, but Derbyshire is still in the 19th century when it comes to EV charging points. And they will put up all sorts of reasons why they can't possibly think about letting us use their curbs. Um, the only hope we have, which is the mitigating factors, is that they're coming up for election next year. And um, they're keen to sort of burnish their green credentials. So we're hoping if we go to them with a complete package of, we've been to some other county councils, there's Bedford and um, Durham are the two really good ones, miles ahead of everybody else. Um, and say, OK, we've sourced out the insurance, we've sourced out the liability, we've sorted out the money. You don't have to do anything at all. All you have to do is say yes. And if we say that at the right point in uh, back end of 2024, we're all starting to worry about their seats. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we hope. Um, so those are the those are the kind of um, stingers for us, but hopefully we'll be able to get past them. So next slide, if that's possible, please. Thank you. So this is just me trying to say, um, you're probably thinking this is all really goofy and why are we even going to bother? Because of course we're not going to succeed. And we really do know that, but we also feel the stakes are so high. Um, you know, saving a couple of million tonnes of CO2 annually feels like um, something worth aiming for at least. And um, if we don't do it, we'll never know. Um, and as I say, we do have this, um, these kind of double benefits, if you like, of the fact that the kind of people who live in the in the houses that we've been talking about, the, the lab rats, um, they're the kind of influences of the area. They get involved in things. They know people. They work in Sheffield. Uh, and I, I'm not much of a believer in baby steps because I think baby steps stretch out two inches and stop. Um, but if there's lots of these things going on in the country, then they are the right sort of people. 
um, to sort of push the projects home, if you like. So we've got that on our side. So it feels like if we really could come up with a case study, which um, we're, even if best of all, if we could use Derbyshire County Council as a sort of beacon to say that Derbyshire County Council have uh, stepped up to this, they put the name behind it, they're giving permission for us to do this, uh, us as a sort of um, private endeavour within the community. Um, and this is the problems that we encountered. This is how we solved them. That would be a, a tremendously worthwhile thing to, to have done. So we're going to plough on. Um, and that's that. <laughs> Sarah, I think that was one of the most inspiring conversations I've listened to for a long time. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, I do hope it works out. Uh, one of the big things I just thought I'd mention um, is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, Jules Thompson was giving a presentation about his community climate action plan, where he emphasised that the entire success of the venture came from getting everyone to join in before they started laying down the law and getting to them to decide what it was that they wanted to do in their community was off to a great start because it was the people themselves who were deciding what they wanted to do. It wasn't the question of the parish council saying, we think you should do this and this is how we do it. It was much more a question of everyone getting together and saying, what is it we want to do? And they'd all thrash out the idea amongst themselves and it had a great start. So clearly you got to the same point in your village. And uh, yeah, thank you very yeah. much. So I, I, I did enjoy that. Congratulations. Um, you're looking good for your next big venture. And let me open up the field for questions. And we've already started with Sarah. Sarah, would you like to give us a shout? Yes, hi, thanks very much. Yes, excellent, uh, Sarah. Oh, we're, we're both Sarah B. Um, <laughs> very useful. I've put some information in the um, chat, um, but I've been talking to Connected Curb. Do you know about them? I have. Uh, I've looked at their website, yes. And I think they're definitely... That's the kind of thing that if we ever get that far, we'd like to pursue. Well, I would recommend that you possibly talk to them now. KCC are also, I notice Oxfordshire um, are quite advanced and KCC and KCC are actually rolling out a second tranche of money for parish councils to put in EV mm -hmm. charging points. So it's a matter of um, also, I would suggest um, chivying up your local um, county association and getting them on board. Yeah, good. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, I know the uh, one of the salespeople at Connected Curb. So I'll may I pass him your details, or would you prefer me just to send them to you, and then you can can you can contact him at a suitable point? I'd love you, please, to give him my details. That would be fantastic. Okay, I'll look them up on your uh, parish website. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. And anybody else who's interested, and in fact, I have seen a parish event they're running. So I've just put a feeler out for what it was, but I looked, I saw it at the weekend and I'm sure I'd had a couple of glasses of wine by then. So <laughs> I'll, if I have any information, I'll send it to Andrew and then he can put it out um, um, via the necessary channels. That's great, Sarah. Thank you very much. Amanda, we're back to you again. Hello, there. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Um, I'm I'm going to have have the recording and, and kind of work my way through all the bits and pieces. Um, but in particular, I love your um your point about community ch and change, and uh, keeping people where not keeping people going where people are at and going from there is so important. And I take your point about as a clock. So taking you where you're at and determined not to do your silka or get the general power of competence for the camp, you know, as a council, um, then I think this is me speaking as a clerk and a councillor. Um, I, I've got a feeling that you wouldn't be able to have a parish council grant for just a handful of individuals, residents. Mm. It'd have to be for community benefit. Yes, you're quite right, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about the wrong project. Um, yeah, you're quite right. However, however, if you were, if, that, if, if one was to create a CIC for this purpose of enabling projects like this all around your parish, you, you might be able to sneak that definition in such a way that 
um, it enables the parish to donate to the CIC. If you really what, that sounds good. I, I, I'm not sure what is or isn't possible. I'm just suggesting to you that there are ways and means of dressing things up that might make it more more um, legal. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and good luck, and thank you for all your ideas. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amanda, and you. And Cara, you've been a great contributor to the um, chat, which I suggest everyone takes a look at, um, because there's all sorts of wonderful ideas popping in there. But um, race ahead with your questions, please. Uh, thanks. Sorry, it's more sort of support, really. I guess um, I've got experience in EV charging historically and also uh, as part of a council. And I, I know um, I'm on the peripheral of it, but I know the Levi funds... Uh, low emission vehicle infrastructure funding that is granted to the uh, transport authority so the county council in some cases have been allocated as um and they are having to apply for it which is a bit annoying but have been allocated a a, a budget for ev charging to support those communities that are lacking in off street parking and some of that i believe is engaging with town and parish councils where they have got also significant numbers of homes that don't have off street parking to be able to put EV charging into public car parks. So it may be another opportunity to kind of look in and just sort of reiterating what's been mentioned before about tapping into your county or uh, transport authority for seeing if that funding is, is available for support for there. Um, but equally, it does make sense not to run <clears throat> EV charging infrastructure yourself having been an EV driver for some time currently not but have done uh, and have been, have worked in a donation EV charging organisation um, EV drivers can be quite grumpy when their EV charging doesn't work and it's done to be so if you have been relying on that particular connection to charge your car and you arrive to find that it's not working it can either be too far to the next one or be incredibly frustrated if you've only got a certain amount of time in order to stop and charge. So it does make sense to partner with an organisation that kind of leads on that. Um, and some of them do also provide, and again, that might impact on the cost per unit of a kilowatt hour to charge an EV, which obviously you want to try and make it as affordable as possible for the end user. Uh, which highlights some of the other points in the chat about cost for energy and EV charging in the public domain. But some do uh, share some of the profits or surplus income that they make from EV charging networks. So it's worth engaging with a few providers perhaps to see. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, they'd want a, a lease of some sorts with that car park or car parking bay for on average around 10 years, which might have an impact too. But, you know, there are lots of options. It doesn't have to all fall on yourself to be managing these charging points should they mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. tricky to, to manage would be my recommendation. We've um, to two of them and I should be very interested to know if there was anybody who isn't kind of, you know, charging the whole whack so yeah thank you i, I can't I'm, i haven't read the chat obviously because i was talking no, um that's um and i now can't work out how to save it on my phone which is even worse i'm hoping graham's going to do that he's going to circulate yeah. it he says yes yeah. Great. To everybody. Yeah. dive into that that would be really useful thank you we had a chat with that well i have spoken to um Ozef about the funding and and they passed me on to the county council who said well basically we've spent it all on the four big settlements um in the area so we thought all right never mind i mean who knows it may change in the future it's actually yeah. keeping up with the funding is really quite difficult so talking quite. in this sort of forum is extremely useful yes and i guess that's really helpful to have these sort of forums to to be able to share experience and see where people are going with it i mean oxford as we mentioned we're in some sort looking at doing a similar scheme by trenching uh through footpaths outside people's homes so again they can then have a kind of home charger as it were in some respects but then highlights mm. the issue around how can we make sure that those bays outside uh, so the homes are secure for their parking to be able to charge up when they need to but there are you know other various schemes being trialed to overcome some of these barriers um for sure but i guess mm. we're all working on the same thing aren't we yeah we're all trying our best to support and improve decarbonizing transport um where everyone across the county so and again datmat's got some good examples that they've looked at different networks as well and how well they are used how much they cost and things like that which is also good mm. to kind of refer and compare and there's senex which i've put in the chat a link to um who are a long-standing organization who've been researching and um 
reviewing a lot of things around EV charging and other decarbonising transport options, which might be worth a look at too, but could be a little bit scientifically based. But uh, anyway, I've used it in the past. Thank, thank you very much. Be quite now. Thank you very much for you and a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. So glad to hear you're passionate about EV charging and driving. Thanks, we'll Cara. Uh, just as a, an example of how successful the Levi system is, um, we have it here in the Isle of Wight. We, Isle of Wight Council was issued a substantial sum of money and they turned around and said, we are required to discuss this with all the parish councils in the island. So we're letting you know that all of the money will be spent on putting charging points into Newport, which by sheer coincidence is where the council is based. And, um, and that's it. So I just mentioned that in passing. David <laughs> Newman, your turn, please. OK. Uh, I am one of the people, visitors who actually charges at places like this, including um, uh, village halls in uh, Wiltshire and even Shap Village, just below the Shap Summit, on my electric motorbike that won't <laughs> charge at the rapid chargers uh, and their AC connections don't work. Okay. Um, I was thinking about funding. Now, here in Oxford, we actually have chargers put in by the district council as well as the county council. There are even lamppost chargers not far from where I live and 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 Actually, four minutes away, there's an enormous charging place on the car park. So I don't know if you've actually thought of looking at whether your district council might get government money to pay for that. Uh, and then also on funding, there is a certain amount of money you can spend on things for which you're, I think it's £10.81 per household yes. that you can spend beyond your power of com without a power of competence mm, yeah, yeah. which yeah. where i'm in a parish council with five thousand houses that's a lot of money uh might not be in yours <laughs> uh, that's it occurred to me um the yes here in oxfordshire the city council done a lot in the city and the county council has done everywhere else including parking places overnight but they haven't done, but the main things for lamppost charges is actually for car clubs. And if you actually want to reduce CO2 production from cars by maximum, it's have a car club where people share cars. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah. Thanks. Yes, that's, Thanks, that's Lovely double whammy, isn't it? Or whatever the opposite of whammy is. <laughs> double benefit. <clears throat> we were in a conversation yesterday where this £10.81 figure came up. And the one thing that the author was at points uh, at pains to point out was that authorisation um, still means you've got to raise the money, but you can raise it on your precept. So um, you are entitled to go to £10 per household or voter, whichever it is, but um, you've got to raise the money yourselves on your precept, so it's not always that popular. Mm -hmm. Stuart, your turn, please. Not coming through yet in sound. Sorry, I, <coughs> Sorry. I was on mute as usual. Uh, I, I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I've had a look at uh, Octopus Energy, and from what I remember, the very cheap rate is only available from about one in the morning to four in the morning. Yeah, it's 12.30 to 4.30. Right. Which actually um, is a very good point because I've only got a 35 kilowatt car, so it just about gets to the end of the drive before it needs recharging. Um, the, so ours is it's easily enough for us. But um, on the other hand, I guess if people are charging every night, because if you have a proper car, then um, you'd probably only need to charge every two or three days, don't you? But it's a very good point. And the, the other question was... Um... Connected curb. These are the lamp post charging system. Um, is Sarah, the other Sarah B there? Sorry, it's the Sarah B there. 
Yes, the other Sarah B's here. Um, <laughs> as far as I'm aware, um, at the moment, no. Um, but uh, again, I can send you some information about about it. And I was actually, is Andrew still online or has he has he gone for lunch? No, he's still here. Andrew, if if you do by any chance have a list of everybody online and where they come from, I think that would be very useful um, so that we can contact them individually or group wise, um, mm -hmm. certainly re regarding this EV session. Right. So I don't know who not... asked that question about yeah. connected curb and lampposts. Yeah. Um, well, there's two answers to that. I mean, we have got contacts of people attending these sessions, but we've got a mailing list of about 500 people and growing. Where no, it's just these sessions I was uh, talking yeah. about. But I'm yeah. just wondering whether people who aren't here today may still be interested in that news about the um, EV. Um, maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, yes, we'll get, we'll need to, what we're about, of course, is the great collaboration is sharing good news and good practice. So yeah, we will. We will find a way. Yeah, great. Was I was who asked that question? Was it Stuart? Yes. If you could pop your contact details in in the chat for me, please. Okay, I'll do that. Excellent. And I, I've got a supplementary question. Um, what is the maximum charging speed in the lamppost chargers? So I, I, I presume lampposts aren't set up to deliver hundreds of amps. <laughs> I suspect it depends very much on whether you're single phase or three phase at that point. Because you're very limited on single phase electricity. Yeah, and I've got no information on lampposts at the moment. Okay, and thanks. lots of dogs, they all do. <laughs> uh, Stuart, are you done with your question? Sorry, I was Yes, you there. thank you. Okay, Lisa, your turn, please. Thanks. Yeah, I've got a couple of points. I've put some in the chat. Um, so companies like Connected Curbs, they will often fund the charger, they'll supply the charger and fund it, and they'll also, importantly, um, be uh, responsible for the maintenance. So it's a great load off of our heads, and they mm. do that for just a small um, cut from the electricity. Um, there is the, um, yeah, also connected curb. They can put in a, strain, a, a string along the whole street, um, but they'll only put in the charges that you want. But they put in blanking plates so that they can ch put in more charges in the future mm. when the proportion of electric cars come. So that might help one of the questions that was in the chat about pushback from Derbyshire County Council. Um, Cara, you said about the support line for um, people that arrive at a charger and it's not working. And um, I've been in that position as well when I've gone down to Devon and needed to charge in order to get home the next day. And it's really frustrating. Um, but very soon it's going to be a legal requirement for chargers to have a telephone number on there with 24 seven support. So using one of these companies to provide that support is I think probably going to be quite important. Mm. Um, and then the last thing was, if you've got, if anyone has parking spaces where there's a time limit, um, or you're thinking of introducing a time limit, if you've got people that come park up to go to work, in order to fit in with a half day's work, so people can come and move the car at lunchtime, you need to make sure that your parking duration is four hours. Our local district council have made their duration of three hours, and people... Mm. Um, can't get out from work at half past 11 every day or every couple of days to move their car. Um, their bosses are going to get really fed up with that. So the charges that our district council have put in just don't get used. And they've become a real um, uh, magnet for the anti-EV mob, which is the last thing we want. But that's all from me. Well, thanks, Lisa. It's fascinating to watch um, the chat as people make their comments so you make a suggestion that immediately triggers either two leads or two statements or two questions so congratulations thank you tristan Brilliant. your turn please uh, thank you um it occurred to me sarah in, in your talk that if you've got a small village with um a row of terrace cottages like you showed and eight bollards um the the sort of threat of charging rage i suppose you'd call it must must be quite great because if you can't if you couldn't charge your car you wouldn't be able to go to work in the morning and if somebody was hogging the space and, and especially parking overnight to get the cheap rate i can imagine people getting you know really 
really stressed by that. Have you have you considered have you considered the sort of consequences of how you can manage fairly so that everybody gets a fair turn and people don't don't really get angry? Charging rage, that is perfect. Thank you. Exactly right. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's at the centre of the whole thing, really. I'm really realising as I'm listening to people talking that A, is an awful lot I don't know, and B, that um, we are only really, I thought we might be quite a sort of general problem, but I think we're quite specific in some ways. But the whole point of this group um, of residents who are all friends and pretty much everybody on that row is is sort of, you know, up for putting up with them for a bit of misery, if you like, to try and sort out how it might work. It, obviously, we'll be talking to them a lot beforehand, um, and it may it may well falter because they'll say that we can't make this work. Mm. Um, but I'm hoping that by having that that group of guinea pigs, um, we will be able to work out how we sort out the social side of it. It's a really good point, and it's I think it's central to our whole problem. Really, somebody just I didn't quite read it, but somebody mentioned on the chat basically what we've got is parking problem, and I think that's absolutely right. Thank you. Nice to meet you, by the way. Well, see you briefly. <laughs> um, let me just ask a question. Andrew, would you be able to take over the hosting of the call? I've just got to go out and make a, a meet a delivery man. Okay. Um, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm on a bit of a deadline for um, uh, 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 taking my wife to Valentine's Day lunch. So I will, I will <laughs> uh, I'll hand it back to you very quickly on your return. Right, I'll be back very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. And then right. uh, Stuart's next with the, the question. <laughs> Stuart, go for it, my friend. Oh, thank you. Um, what I'm trying to do locally is get solar panels on our village hall and solar canopies over the car parking spaces together with batteries uh, and introduce um, charging points. I was wondering if anyone had any experience of linking these three technologies together. Good question. Any anybody got the hand of it? Sarah B. Sarah B. One. <laughs> I think I'm Sarah B. A. And the other Sarah is Sarah B. One. So um, a, a little bit. We have got some solar panels going on our church roof, and um, my my dream was that we would uh, use them for car charging points as well. There were issues with the distance. You've probably got to be underneath the eaves of the church before it works. Otherwise, all the energy attenuates down the line. Um, but the other problem, and this may not, this may go away as technology advances, but certainly two years ago, um, the expert, the solar panels expert that we had out said, it'll take everything you've got off the, of the sunshine. And we also wanted to use some of it to heat the church and run the refrigerators in the community shops. So, um, you know, exactly, it's, it's EV charging points are so thirsty that yeah. um, you'd have to have a lot of solar panels. I could probably dig out this bloke's name and um, talk to you some more if you like, Stuart. That'd be kind, yes. Yeah, shall we talk offline? Yeah. Shall I, uh, I'll pop my email in. Oh, please. Cara. Thanks. Just to add to that, which is uh, very eloquently explained, is that, yes, electric vehicles need a lot of power and solar is a bit intermittent and actually doesn't produce enough directly. So you'd probably need a battery yeah. to store enough Mm. It'd also be very expensive. But on top of that, we're looking, well, there's a lot of discussion around embodied energy. So solar panels themselves use a lot of energy to be created, um, adding another battery system to be able to store enough to charge up electric vehicles adds more into that scenario. And so the question is actually, it's probably better to utilize the grid for your electricity demand for EV charging than it is to then try and provide it through solar wind turbines would be even better because they produce a lot more energy but of course then the planning and opportunity to put them in is, is even more difficult there are a number of companies uh, now that do do a solar canopy battery storage and easy charging but you're looking at extortionate amounts of money to be able to put that in um and so it's kind of weighing up all these reasons why you would need to do that without kind of looking at supporting maybe community energy to install a much larger scale solar installation nearby that would maybe put enough into the grid to then sort of offset that with your needs for taking it off for EV charging. Um, so it's slightly more broader complexities to kind of look at. But as Sarah has said, basically, you can't fit enough on a roof really to charge a car. Um, having said that, I do know somebody who's got an off-grid setup, but again, the battery size of that vehicle is 
scale to the size of their solar, um, which is fine for an individual. But when you're looking at that kind of supporting public usage, it's going to be very much more unknown as to how much can be used, the size of the batteries and the demand profile. And so it becomes more complicated to be able to do that. Am I right in thinking that um, when car batteries are spent, they use them to make um, the roof batteries? I love them. Yeah, indeed. So a lot of the uh, industrial size um, storage is utilising spent. When you say spent, um, they degrade over a long time, but to around about 80% capacity, which is great for storing uh, other types of renewable energy. But obviously, if you're an EV driver, you kind of want it able to hold more power depending on your journey. So waffling, I'll be quiet now, but yes, that is correct. <laughs> Scarra. David, you're up next, please. Yes. There's actually, round the corner for me, next to a leisure centre, charging points and solar panels in canopies over the car park as well as in the leisure centre. So it's not impossible. They didn't in ever intend to have all the electricity coming from the solar panels. It just reduces the demand from the grid. And the problem they had was when they installed the canopies, they did it so badly, they had to take down all the solar panels and the canopies and rebuild because the uh, company that put it in didn't make it strong enough. And that meant there was a whole year where there was no solar panels over the car park but right now they put it back with a better company and there's two charging points one for taxis and one for guests brilliant it's just well i hope that a, a, a huge part of great collaboration is going to be where we can all learn from each other's mistakes mm -hmm. and not have to repeat them so that's wonderful to hear, uh, David. Thank you. That's Oxfordshire, I take it. That's really that's actually uh, in Oxford, in Blackbird uh, Lee's Leisure Centre. So okay, that'll be an watch out follow. for the quality of construction as <laughs> things can go wrong. <laughs> yes, thank you, Amanda. Hello. Um, I put in the chat about um, well, two two things really. One is that uh, Cotswold District Council's car park they put in the EV charges when they did up the car park over a year ago now, and they still have not got electric um, connection put in by the power company. So you may well find that you've got a plan for your cash flow because you might not start to get the income in to cover the outlay that you've had to put in months in advance. And if you do get to that point, I've also got a suggested solution, which is also what I put in the chat about a partnership between mid County Scout and um, Octopus, and it's called Unity. Um, I've mentioned it on here before, and Michaela Cryer, from, who's jointly employed by the two to look at community energy schemes, um, she's, present, she's willing to present to this group in, um, in the near future. And they have a fund that acts as like a bridging loan. So if you find yourself in this sort of situation and you have a definite good business plan that will pay back, because obviously it's got to be commercially um, reliable as well, but um, they could, might be able to help you with the cash flow in the interim. Interesting. So that's another one to look out for. Uh, you could look up online about Unity. Uh, it's spelled Y-O-U, Nitty. All oh, right, I've never yeah. found that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope that helps. Great, thank you. Well, as, as ever, the um, the leads and the chats and everything here is going to be a, a whole volume of information in itself. So thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else want to make any points or ask any questions before we wrap up for the day, please? Um, the, oh. Could I just say thank you so much to everybody for turning up and being so informative. Really helpful. Thank um, you. We, Great we didn't talk. really feel like guinea pigs at all. So, um, Sarah, Sarah, congratulations on a, on a wonderful um, debut, and oh, thank you. you'll find that you're now in huge demand from all sorts of uh, populations, so congratulations, and we look forward to hearing more. Um, thank, you. thank you all very much for your time, it's a pleasure to see you all, and uh, look forward to next time.
I would just let you know that next week, the topic we even know in advance, which is a great step forward on my part, <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about sustainable transport. And uh, do please uh, tune in, same time, same place, next week. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.